I think that uh, the notion of the dispositive begins in a certain media and material and historical formation. And I think that we're, we're at a moment right now where um, in a moment of the Anthropocene and climate change where things have shifted completely. So let me go back. I mean, the first sort of moon in cinema is, of course, Melies' Voyage to the Moon. And, you know, I rewatched it recently and it's such a funny uh, film because it actually begins with these like wizard figures who I think are meant to be futuristic, but also look like they come from, you know, they're sort of remediations of the medieval or uh, age or something like that. So very, very kind of strange. Um, and then there's, you know, the famous scene where the rocket comes and hits the man and the moon in the eye. What's interesting about that, right, and everybody remembers that scene, but that scene is followed by, I mean, it's, it's like a cut, right? Uh, and followed by then a scene of the scientists or wizards or whatever they are who, you know, gets shot to the moon, a scene of them on the moon. They're not in the eye of the moon. So on the one hand, that eye of the moon is just like a kind of metaphor or something, you know, whereas when, when you see it in cinema histories, it seems like, you know, it's somehow meant to be, they really thought it was hitting the eye. I mean, I think they really didn't. In any event, so the first, um, so the earliest representation of the moon in uh, cinema is in kind of silent early cinema. So, and I think that representations of the moon beyond that have always sort of been connected to the material possibilities, material techniques, the dispositif of a particular moment. So Melies obviously was tremendously limited. His uh, cinematic dispositif was, was fairly primitive. Um, and then well, there are representations of the moon, and I'm not an expert on representations of the moon in any event. I would like jump to the next sort of famous moment of the moon in cinema, which is really the moon in video. Um, and that is when U.S. men first walked on the moon. And that walking on the moon was as much a media event as it was anything else. And so you go from in a certain sense, maybe we'll think about this as sort of three moments of early dispos three early moments of different dispositifs. So uh, Melius' film, Man in the Moon, is um, a moment of the beginning of cinema and the dispositif of celluloid film and the techniques of editing and so forth. You've then got this video from the moon, 1960. Eight, I think 69 when the first US astronauts walked on the moon and now we're in a kind of moment of live cinema I mean of live video and the moment of live video is a really important moment in the history of mediation and the history of sort of audiovisual mediation and so that was the real excitement the quality was horrible just as with Melies I mean the representation of the move was primitive so you have two primitive techniques but um, the emphasis is on a kind of liveness rather than on a kind of theatricality and a kind of fabrication that you see in the Melies film. So in that respect, two, those are two interesting examples of sort of lunar representation um, at the beginning of different sort of dip dispositifs or different moments of media history or media, different media formations. So today, um, it's not clear to me what, I mean, we don't have a really good example of that. I mean, there's, we have the Martian for Mars, but the example that comes to mind for me in a way is melancholia, where although the planet that is about to hit the earth and mark the sort of end of, presumably the end of life on earth, um, appears in the sky the way the moon does. I mean, there's no other planetary body that, that appears in the sky. So in that respect, you have um, a 
a kind of similar uh, version of that, I think, in contemporary film. And it's a contemporary film that really harkens back, as I argued in a piece on post-atavistic cinema, harkens back to the earliest moments of cinema and early cinema technologies um, with the, uh, the, I forget the name of the, they have this uh, screen technique, oh, sorry, telescopes they're using to see the air balloons and also some things that look like magic lanterns. So. so that's kind of incoherent, but a kind of way to think about it. For this event, maybe I should say something about the idea of the moon as kind of queering the earth and also the idea of, um, in a sense, the Anthropocene is kind of queering the dispositif. And those are the two things I've been thinking about just in relation to this festival. Um, first, I think the moon has always been like the Earth's queer body. I mean, you've got these two planets that are together. There's this kind of bond between them. Um, in fact, there is a, a bond, a gravitational bond. Um, the moon has no future in, uh, Leo Bersani's sense, uh, and uh, no, not Bersani's sense. So, uh, sorry, I'll come back to it. Uh, in the sense of queer theory, uh, generally, and there's a particular book called Lee Edelman. Thank you. So, uh, in Lee Edelman's sense of no future, the moon, like the unlike the Earth, has no future. Uh, Edelman argues that queer couples don't. In, with their inability to reproduce, don't have a future that they can, you know, of, of reproducing, them, reproducing themselves in the same way in which straight couples do. And it's a, comp, it's a uh, controversial theory, and it's been attacked by many people, um, both in uh, queer theory from a kind of male perspective, but I think especially from feminist queer theory. Um, but there is this idea, if you, if you think about the moon in relation to the earth, the earth is reproductive. Life is produced and reproduced on the earth. The moon, not so much. Um, it's, as far as we know, there's no life there. So that's one way in which the earth and the moon are kind of um, queer buddies in that respect. But also I think what's happened with the notion of the dispositive, and I was talking about it in this kind of conventional notion before as concerning technologies, that the sort of at cinematic apparatus that allows cinema to be produced and uh, displayed, exhibited, and so forth. Um, that notion of the, of the dispositif got expanded by Foucault, who wanted to think about it in terms of social, uh, juridical, cultural, linguistic formations, scientific formations. That is, there was an apparatus that wasn't just cinematic, but there was a larger sense in which that notion of a cinematic apparatus could be applied to a large, to a kind of discursive uh, matrix that Foucault was so interested in. And Agamben picks up on that um, and especially adds language to that. But I think that was implicit in Foucault. But I think what happens with the Anthropocene is that the Anthropocene forces us to queer the notion of the dispositive because in the traditional notion of the dispositive, whether just being concerned with cinematic production and exhibition or being concerned more with a kind of socio-technical apparatus, the one thing that's left out is nature, is the non-human. And what the Anthropocene has done in, for theory, I think, is force us to see uh, non-human nature, to see humans as having an impact on the planet that is non-human as well as human. That is, Foucault, Agamben have focused on human elements, on society, on law, on discipline, and so forth, on the, the hospital, um, all of these different, on the university, on culture, all of these different human formations. But what the Anthropocene has taught us is that because of what we've done technologically to the climate, to the planet, humans now have become non-human forces as well. And the Anthropocene marks this idea that we will have a, a geological epoch marked by the impact of humans, not marked by the shifting of, 
uh, different kind of planetary formations. And when that happens, I think we need to think about the moon now, the moon now as a stand-in, I think, for all of nature, all of planetary nature, to think of them as dispositifs themselves. And that, that we no longer can think of nature as outside the dispositive, nature as the sort of field of action in which dispositives operate. But now we have to think about the natural world itself as part of that dispositive. And I think that um, if one thinks about the moon today in the era of the Anthropocene, that's what it gets you.